Well, hello everyone. Thank you for sticking with us for yet another panel. I am super excited for this panel on perfect partners for clean energy production. We have heard a lot about the importance of nuclear energy and the need for nuclear energy. But as many in the room know, the nuclear industry faces challenges with attracting new investors and also in creating customer bases beyond just the power sector. So we have an excellent lineup of panelists today that come from the a wide variety of the nuclear energy industry, including technology providers, demand off takers, and the national labs which are working to make sure nuclear technology is innovated in a way to meet the diversity of demand for nuclear energy. Our panelists will showcase the newest in nuclear energy technology and also discuss opportunities to improve collaboration and investment in this field. So I'm going to turn my very first question to Zoe. We just heard this week the announcement that China has put online their first fourth-of-a-kind generation, the first generation reactor, the first in the world. Can you please introduce yourself and talk a bit more about the successes of this reactor, what led to getting to this point, and the hopes for this technology moving forward? Okay, thank you. My name is uh, Zhou Zhengyu. Uh, come from China National a nuclear power company uh, CEO. Uh, yes, uh, as you heard that uh, the high temperature uh, gas cold reactor now is in commercial operation. Uh, that, that's a, a, a small reactor. Uh, it's 100 megawatt uh, each and uh, double uh, reactor together. Uh, now, uh, the, the reactor temperature can reach more than uh, 500 degree. Uh, because this is the first uh, uh, two reactor, so the, the price is high. So now uh, we are uh, designed the, the uh, six, six reactor module uh, that will be a 600 megawatt uh, uh, reactor for the next. And, uh, the, the reactor is, uh, now we are used, uh, designed for uh, the, the Hualong, that's the PWR, uh, produce 300 uh, degree Celsius of steam. And then we use the, uh, the high gas temperature uh, to heat the steam to over uh, 500 degree and combined with the uh, petrol chemistry, so uh, solve the problem of uh, petrol chemistry uh, industry energy requirement. So uh, the, in the future, the petrol chemistry can use the green energy to, uh, to produce. Uh, now, uh, the, after uh, the, the, the six uh, unit uh, put it together, the price will decrease. And uh, the next year, uh, the demonstration of the uh, reactor power steam supply to chemistry industry uh, will, will be constructed uh, during, uh, in two areas uh, in China. Thank you, and it's super exciting to see this technology take a step into the commercial space. You know, speaking of high temperature gas cooled reactors, Cam, I'm gonna go to you next. I wanna learn more a little bit about X Energy and its customers, but first I wanna start with what on earth a space entrepreneur is doing getting into the nuclear field. And if we're having a conversation about how nuclear energy providers can meet the growing demand, as an investor, where did you see the demand? Why did you get into the nuclear space? And why do you think X Energy is fitting a specific niche? Only a crazy person would leave the space technology <laughs> to do nuclear because it's not easy. <laughs> but uh, how I got started is I have uh, uh, over 40 years of experience in uh, all kinds of uh, space programs. Uh, I have multiple commercial space companies. Today, we're building the uh, first private commercial space station, uh, as well as moon lander that goes to the surface of the moon and other things. In fact, our uh, first launch to the moon since Apollo Day would be uh, January of next year. 
But the reason how I got from space uh, to nuclear, um, uh, the, the real story is that I, uh, um, uh, I was asked to help uh, four orphans in Africa uh, in 2007. And uh, so, so I started the school there in Kinshasa, uh, which is the capital of uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. And, uh, and that school sort of grew later. Today is about 800 kids that are there, and uh, you know, we feed the kids every day. Um, but you know, when I visited the school, uh, the school didn't have power, right? And I, it really occurred to me that, uh, that there's this direct relationship uh, between electricity and standard of living around the world. In the other words, if you don't have electricity, you don't have education, you don't have clean water. And, and the other part of it is, you know, around 2007, 2008, you know, uh, the, the starting really the climate change crisis and everything else that was going on. And truly it was more for me giving back than anything else. And I felt like it was a sort of a responsibility, if you will, that uh, we take care of our children and grandchildren and leave this earth in a better place than we found it. There's this uh, thing by Emerson that he says, we don't inherit the planet from our ancestors, we're borrowing it from our children. And so I wanted to just sort of get into it, uh, didn't know how, uh, uh, maybe not smart I was at the time, <laughs> uh, but that, that's how I really got into it and uh, through some amazing synchronicity, got connected to MIT, which led me to, um, uh, you know, triazole-based uh, uh, particles and uh, uh, pebble bed modular reactors, and uh, I just realized that it's just an incredible technology, uh, and, you know, the holy grail in nuclear is, of course, safety, and the, the good thing about uh, our technology as well as what China has done is that it's 100% safe and it's not, uh, not, not because of uh, some intervention electronically but uh, in terms of physics. So in the other word, if there's a tsunami or earthquake or, or plane crashes into it, it, it can never get to a super critical situation. Um, and the, and the te technology itself is quite remarkable but uh, that's, that's how I got into, into, um, uh, into, the, into the company and uh, we really made a light year's progress over the years and I, I just want to uh, congratulate uh, Mr. Zhou and China for making the, 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 the reactors actually operational and working because that sort of proves our case. <laughs> in fact, this, this technology works and is effective and operational. Um, uh, you know, in terms of um, your uh, second question, I think one of the key things that Mr. Zhou also talked about is um, the HTGR because of the temperature that they, they generate uh, are really uh, incredibly good for uh, applications such as water desalinization, hydrogen pr production, uh, steel factories, cement factories, uh, you know, uh, and, and, in, and especially the industrial application. I mean, we also are cogen where we not only generate uh, uh, heat or hot steam, uh, but also electricity, but especially in the industrial uh, application is our sweet spot. Uh, and in fact, our first customer is uh, Dow Chemicals, uh, where we're building our first plant in uh, Cedar Reef, Texas, and the first application is a thermal application um, uh, for a petrochemical uh, company. You mentioned passive safety, and then you just mentioned a whole host of the exciting, innovative design for nuclear energy. And I want to turn it over to Shannon, because at Idaho National Lab, there's been a lot of work trying to improve the design for nuclear energy for a whole host of applications. So how is the lab approaching the challenge of making sure the reactors are designed to meet different applications? And um, in particular, if you could touch on what is going on in the United States with the Earthshots program as well, and how nuclear is contributing to broader clean energy goals. So thank you, Lindsay, and thank you for the opportunity to, to be here to talk about some of this really important work. I, I think first we need to think about why did we start looking at these more complex systems? Why did we start thinking about utilizing nuclear energy differently than we have for decades? 
And ultimately, it comes down to the need to utilize our invested capital in the best way possible. And we need to remember that nuclear energy is primarily a producer of heat. So anytime we go through electricity and, and then back to heat in those applications, we lose a lot of energy and we're not best utilizing what we have invested. And as we move forward in this world and we need more and more energy, more and more clean energy, we need to use it in the most optimal way possible. So we started to ask those questions as to how we could do this first with our existing fleet existing fleet that's seeing the pressure of more and more renewables coming online in certain regions that are driving the price of electricity very low and in some cases even negative at certain times, uh, rather than dialing back the power. How can we redirect that to meet some of these other demands for clean energy? And then if we were to start from scratch, a greenfield system, how do we optimally design those interfaces to supply that heat to hydrogen production, to desalination, to those chemical plants that also need clean heat, clean steam, and electricity to do this. So we've focused quite a bit within uh, my division, within the, the research programs that I lead, on the best design for those interface technologies. How do we ensure that when we provide that steam to those chemical applications that we don't have any potential for radioactive contamination? We don't have any uh, new accident scenarios that are going to cause challenges to implementing these systems. So we want to go about designing these interfaces in the technically best way to ensure that safety of the overall operation, but then also optimize how we deliver energy to continue to meet that range of demands, to continue to meet electricity demand, as well as the demand for heat or hydrogen for these other coupled applications. So we've been doing a lot of work at the laboratories. My colleagues do a lot of work on reactor design, materials and fuels development. And when we begin looking at how we then couple those to these diverse applications, how do we demonstrate that? How do we move forward and demonstrate that we can scale these technologies up that we can be supportive very broadly to the industry to ensure that we don't just have a solution for one technology, but a solution for many technologies and across many different companies as we begin to deploy these systems. So the national laboratories, we don't necessarily develop those new technologies, but we work to fill that gap between fundamental science and those that will take those technologies to a commercial implementation at large scale giving the opportunity to leverage very unique facilities across the laboratory complex, giving opportunity to access very unique skill sets at the laboratories and then broadly implement that. So Lindsay, you mentioned the Earthshots program. DOE, I like to say, is doubling down on this commitment to clean energy. I think this is a social responsibility that we implement more and more clean energy. And DOE has announced now seven different Earthshots starting with the hydrogen shot that aims to produce clean hydrogen at less than one US dollar per kilogram, which sounds a little bit outlandish for those of you tracking the, the price of hydrogen right now and the clean hydrogen, uh, but it is what we are working toward and we do see some uh, pretty significant pathways at least to two dollars per kilogram and then we'll push further to try to get to uh, even lower uh, prices for that clean hydrogen. And once you have ample clean hydrogen, you have so many more opportunities uh, towards some of these other areas. Two other earth shots that I'd like to specifically mention because I think they're ideal for nuclear integration are industrial decarbonization as well as clean fuels and products, both of which seek to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by more than 85% by 2035. So we have some really significant goals out there and the Department of Energy is putting dollars behind those goals. Uh, for example, we heard yesterday about some of the hydrogen hubs and more than 8 billion US dollars are going toward hydrogen hub demonstrations, uh, at least two of which will include nuclear energy. The application of nuclear energy for clean hydrogen I think is one of the most exciting ones. I was in Remscheid, Germany a couple months ago for a, a clean tech festival and we visited a steel facility there that currently runs on natural gas but is looking to switch over to clean hydrogen, but hydrogen is currently still five times the cost. And so there's a real challenge in being able to produce the steel, which in this facility is used to produce wind turbines. So it's part of the broader clean energy supply chain. So nuclear's role in clean hydrogen production is super exciting. And I can't talk about green hydrogen or steel without finally looping you into the conversation, Hassan. 
So the Emirates Steel Archon is the UAE's largest steel and building materials manufacturer and is also doing a first-of-a-kind demonstration for green hydrogen. Can you talk about, as both a, a supplier for the nuclear industry and in providing rebar for nuclear power plants and also as a customer and using nuclear energy for your facilities, how do you view the role of nuclear energy in steel production and what role does it play in an Emirates Steel Archon? Thank you, Lindsay. And Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Hassan, and I am from uh, Emirates Steel Arkan in Abu Dhabi. We are the only integrated steel producer in the country. But there is a story behind this uh, small company. You know. um, basically, we are fully committed to the subject of decarbonization. And I'm going to share with you just a few numbers to show you on where we are on this journey. And then we'll discuss how clean electricity and hydrogen will come into this. Um, in the beginning, we need to remember that the problem the world is facing today is the emission of greenhouse gases. We are emitting 50 billion tons of CO2 to the atmosphere every year. 3.6 billion of that comes from the steel industry the global steel industry. So the commitment under the Paris Accord is to reduce this, first by 40% by the year 2030, and then net zero by 2050. What I will share with you today is that we are already very much advanced on this journey. The, the journey started by selecting the technology that we employed in our plants. So if you think that the world is producing 1.95 billion tons of steel every year now, which is set to grow to around 2.5 billion within the next 10 years, the world emits roughly 1.9 tons of CO2 per ton of steel. For every ton of steel we produce, there is 1.9 tons of CO2 going to the air. Look around you in this room and just imagine how much steel there is in this room and how much CO2 has gone to the air. So the worst um, CO2 emitters are the blast furnaces. The 70% of the world production of steel comes from blast furnaces. They use coal. The world average, as we said, is 1.9. At Emirates Steel, we selected a better technology. We selected the direct reduction, which is gas-based, with electric arc furnaces. So the starting point for us was 1.5 tons of CO2. Over the years, we embarked on an energy efficiency program to make sure that we have very efficient use of our electricity. We complied with the uh, uh, Energy Star program from California. And that put us as a category A energy consumer in the UAE. And then in 2017, we started a carbon capture and sequestration program. We capture 700,000 tons of our CO2 emissions, and we store them in the ground with the help of Adriada and Adnoc. With that, we managed to reduce our CO2 footprint from 1.5 to 1.1. The next step was to use clean electricity. Emirates Steel today uses 70% nuclear power and 10% solar. And that has reduced our carbon footprint to 0.7. By next year, we will drop to 0.6 through the use of scrap. We're going to recycle more scrap and therefore reduce our CO2 footprint more. The final step is to start using hydrogen, which is now scheduled for the year 2027. And that will let us drop to 0 0.3, which is the net zero. You know? Now, this is our journey at Emirates Steel to reduce the CO2. So how does it impact the rest of the world? Learning about what we have been doing, some international companies have come and knocked on our door. They said, how did you do this? So we showed them. Today, Emirates Steel Arkan is about to develop a massive eco-hub in Abu Dhabi to produce steel that will serve the steel industry globally, meaning we will produce very low carbon footprint uh, steel, which will replace the blast furnaces in Japan, in Korea, and even in Germany. 
So the idea is that they will shut down their blast furnaces and we will build plants similar to what we have today, produce very low carbon footprint. And with that, we hope that we will start this chain reaction of producing global green steel. Mr. Zoe, we've just heard a great example of where nuclear energy can play in an area outside of the power sector in steel production and, and green hydrogen production. We know that China has a goal to reach 10% electricity from nuclear energy by 2035. There are clearer applications for nuclear energy in the power sector in China, but where else is China looking to use nuclear energy and where, what other applications beyond for electricity um, is China National Nuclear Power exploring? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, now, in China, uh, around the nuclear power plant, uh, like uh, north of China, uh, the people need uh, uh, heating their room. Uh, before, uh, we use the uh, coal, burn, burn the coal to, uh, to uh, heating their room, but uh, cause uh, a lot of pollution. And also, uh, of course, the carbon dioxide. Uh, now, uh, we use the uh, nuclear power plant to supply uh, the, the heat to their room. And uh, uh, like uh, in, in my, comp my uh, plant I worked before, uh, we supply uh, the nuclear power to, to our uh, local people. And uh, uh, in one wind, uh, uh, cost of the uh, heating, that's around uh, 500 uh, US dollar. So the, the, that's very cheap and uh, it's very clean. And uh, the local people, uh, they find that uh, uh, use the nuclear uh, energy to heating their room and uh, they, they, they will see that uh, uh, nuclear power is safe enough. And also, we use the, uh, the nuclear power to send the heat to the local industry. Uh, so the, the local industry people say that, uh, that that's a stable and a lower price than use the, the gas to, 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 to make the energy. So uh, the nuclear power plant, around the nuclear power plant uh, will have uh, a price uh, lower uh, energy uh, area, so uh, absorb the, the the people and the industry to this area, and uh, we also uh, doing the uh, uh, study that uh, we want to supply the uh, the north of China uh, use the nuclear energy instead of uh, fossil. Uh, like uh, coal burn, uh, the plant uh, will be uh, movable, and uh, I, uh, the the reactor power uh, come to the uh, connect the, the local heating system in the winter and uh, supply the, the heat, and uh, after that, after uh, when when it's hot, uh, the reactor will move back to the plant to do the manufacturing, to do the uh, refueling, and uh, uh, after that, uh, uh, in the winter, supply again, move, move back to the... So in the local area, there is no uh, radiation uh, waste uh, in the local area. So uh, this kind of will, will be uh, more uh, benefit uh, for the local people and uh, more easy to be accepted and uh, uh, the no no uh, carbon dioxide uh, emission. So uh, I think uh, this kind of small reactor will have uh, a good future. I'm glad you bring up the district heating application because after we get beyond power sector, people then pretty much turn to industrial processes. But we're seeing this district heating application play a very important role, not just in China, but 
a lot in Eastern Europe as well. For example, the Czech Republic is looking to build, a, is building a pipeline from one of their reactors to the city center to provide district heating. So it's, it's a very important application that honestly we don't hear a lot about in these dialogues. So I appreciate that. Um, but now I'm going to switch right back to industrial applications of nuclear. So Cam, we're, we're right back with you. I would love for you to give us some more specifics on the customers for X Energy. You have Dow in the United States, but X Energy is looking beyond just the U.S. playing field. So give us a bit more detail on who your customers are. Sure. So uh, as you know, we were, uh, there were two companies in the United States that were the recipient of advanced reactor uh, demonstration program. Uh, one is uh, uh, Terra Power, and the other one is X Energy. Uh, our overall grant was close to two and a half billion dollars, which is 50-50 cost share with the U.S. government. And so, uh, as you indicated, our first plant uh, we're building is Sea Drift, Texas, uh, with with that chemical. But in addition to that, we um, uh, have a relationship with uh, Ontario Power Generation in Canada. Uh, as well as having a joint venture with them for industrial uh, need uh, in the entire country, uh, as well as electricity. Um, uh, Energy Northwest, state of Washington, recently announced that they're planning uh, to buy maybe 12 plants from us. Um, and uh, hopefully the next few days you see some announcement in that regard, uh, further announcement in that regard. Um, so uh, those are some of the applications. But you know, our, our, uh, we're also working globally with other people. We have a, a UK presence as well. We're working with United Kingdom, um, mostly on the industrial application. Uh, so um, you know, and you mentioned Eastern Europe. Um, we'll be working uh, with Eastern European countries, and we have a, we're going to have a partner in Eastern Europe, specifically Poland. Uh, Poland, for example, has more coal plants than anywhere else in Europe. And the way we've designed our reactors uh, in terms of the size, which is each unit is 80 megawatt uh, electric, uh, 200 megawatt thermal, uh, but our plant is four units, so it's overall 320 megawatt uh, electric. It retrofits very nicely in the coal plant. So in the other words, you take the engine out of a coal plant and you put it in there. So we spend a lot of time in terms of the sizing of uh, our, our reactors. Uh, and also we designed it such a way where the modules can be carried in the back of a truck or back of a train. So it can really be um, uh, transported anywhere, uh, anywhere in the world. And our, our vision is really very disruptive in that we're not thinking about one-offs. We're thinking about having, uh, and by the way, we're all, also um, uh, a, a, another commercial company where we build our own fuel uh, manufacturing, which is, I think, really, really important. In fact, uh, we broke ground in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, to build the first advanced reactor uh, fuel manufacturing capability in Northern America. Uh, so the idea that the vision that we have is uh, really have more of a factory setting where you can uh, put these reactors together, like if you, if, if you will, like Legos, and, and, and be able to send it to the field and assemble it uh, in, in that way. Have the fuel in different parts of the world uh, where you can have the fuel also shipped to the side. Uh, and, and, and so very much more of a, if, if you can think of like a Tesla model or, or SpaceX model where, um, because the world needs so many of these, uh, you know, I think we need to really think differently in terms of how these are produced, more like car manufacturing or electric car manufacturing, where it can be delivered to different locations in the world as we need it. Can we use the current large light water fleet for many of these applications, including district heating or hydrogen? Do you need these advanced designs in order to meet these other applications? How can the different types of reactors play in meeting the diversity of demand that we've just discussed? Thank you, Lindsay. And I, I think that's a really key question because there, 
was a misconception for a very long time that you absolutely have to have a high temperature reactor for some of these high temperature industrial applications or uh, for high temperature hydrogen production. And certainly those could be more efficient and more effective overall, but we need everything we've got. We need all of our clean energy assets. We need the existing, we need the future. So how are we doing that? Uh, one thing is looking at ways in which we can augment heat from a light water reactor. If we have excess generation from existing fleet technologies, we need to use that. We need to use that to support the regional industries, to support the growing demand for clean hydrogen. So that's exactly what we're demonstrating now is uh, my laboratory, we're the lead nuclear energy laboratory in the U.S., but we also lead work on high temperature steam electrolysis. Uh, we operate those systems at 700, 800 degrees Celsius, but we're demonstrating that with a steam generator providing 150 degrees C steam, we can effectively produce hydrogen with those high temperature electrolysis systems. And that's through the utilization of first augmenting that heat when we start up that system, but then there's also significant opportunity for heat recuperation within those systems that we can take advantage of and thus be able to produce with very high efficiency that hydrogen. We can begin to use some of these same types of approaches with other applications as well and thus leverage that excess generation that we have available from uh, some of those existing fleet plants in regions that have more and more penetration from renewables or we have uh, opportunity for flexible operation, maybe the grid doesn't always need that energy, and we can redirect that to these other applications. And where necessary, we can build in storage to ensure that all of those demands are being met uh, when, when they're uh, needing that energy. So that's one misconception I do like to get, uh, get out there, is that we don't have to go to those high temperature reactors, but there's benefit to it. Just because we don't have to doesn't mean there's not a demand for those as well because we all, uh, as engineers, would understand that higher temperatures give us higher efficiencies. We also can look at smaller footprint systems. We can look at so many advances that we have made in the last uh, many decades since we started using nuclear energy and em employ those in these advanced reactors, and we can begin thinking about those applications from day one. Rather than retrofitting some of these designs, we can design in optimal interfaces with these industrial demands and get even more efficiency out of these systems. So bottom line, we can do some of these things with what we have, but we can do even more with the advanced reactors and we'll need it all to, to meet our really aggressive goals for uh, clean energy and net zero solutions. When I was first entering the nuclear energy field, I was kind of initially sold into it, someone said it was not your granddad's reactor, and that really cracked me up and showed <laughs> that there's some exciting innovation in the space, but I've seen firsthand, especially in the work that we do in Europe, the value of these large light water reactors as well, so it's nice that you're pointing out it's the benefits of what we have versus the innovative technology. Cam, you raised your hand, so yeah. I'm going to allow you to jump I in I just here. wanted to sort of um, uh, reinforce the point that uh, she made. There is, um, you know, there's incredible amount of data centers now in the world yeah. and, uh, and AI applications. I mean, these are sort of new things. Mm -hmm. And especially with uh, advanced reactors, because of the high temperature application and safety, especially the safety, mm -hmm. you can literally have an advanced reactor in the middle of a data center. And in fact, we're having discussion with many of the uh, organizations that have data centers like Google, like Amazon, others, and also cloud computing. Um, so, so these as as AI technology, as data center technology. The other one is really quantum computing uh, is coming more and more. Mm -hmm. These advanced reactors, especially with the high temperature gas reactors, are really suitable to be able to sort of do. You can't put a, a thousand megawatt, if you will. Uh, reactor in the middle of a data center. Uh, so I think some of these new applications are also in in really incredibly important. Well, and you're highlighting new applications that are going to cause a huge increase in the demand for electricity in general. That's right. Hassan, you were talking about this earlier about um, before we got on the stage about the huge growth in demand for clean electricity just at large. I'm curious if you can speak a bit more to what is next for, or what is needed to get to the next stage in nuclear energy deployment, use of nuclear for steel. You spoke about getting from 
point, 1.5 to, to below that, of around one for tons of CO2 per tons of steel. What is necessary to get to the next level, or is it just baked in? Yeah. <clears throat> so um, what we were talking about earlier is that the demand for electricity in the world is growing. But it's growing at a phenomenal pace. So for example, I'll just give you some numbers. In the beginning of the 20th century, the 1,900, the Earth was consuming 10,000 terawatt hours of electricity. A hundred years later, we were consuming 110,000 terawatt hours. We've grown from 10,000 to 110,000 in a hundred years. The last 20 years, we added 50,000. We are now at 160,000 terawatt hours. That's how much hungry the world is for energy. And it's going to keep going. It's not going to stop with the development that we anticipate in India, in Indonesia, in all the high population countries. We're going to see a massive surge in power demand. OK, now let's look where is it going to come from. Today, 86% of the world energy is produced from fossil fuels, a third from coal, a third from fuel, and a third from natural gas. Only 14% comes from renewable energy. So not only we need to switch the existing power capacity to renewables, whether nuclear or solar or hydroelectric or uh, wind, but we also need to cater for the coming requirements of energy. You know, and this is why I think moving forward, it's not going to be one solution, like one magic walk can you fix everything. The future energy networks will be very different from the current future um, energy networks, meaning, for example, the classical model of generation, transmission, and consumption is history. Now you're going to have multiple points of generation, transmission, with artificial intelligence controlling the movement of electrons around to keep the energy running at the most efficient levels. And everybody has to play a role, the nuclear mm -hmm. and everything else, because the demand of mankind for power is phenomenal. We have time for about one more round of questions, but I'm going to ask each of you to try and stick to about two minutes, otherwise we're not going to fit it in. Can I get a guarantee that we can do that? Great. So, <laughs> Mr. Zoe, I'm going to start with you. If we're able to meet this growing demand for clean electricity, clean energy writ large, a lot of that is going to be coming from renewable energy. China is one of the leading producers, not just of nuclear, but in building new renewable energy. What are some of the challenges of integrating nuclear energy into a renewable energy system and building these two future sources of clean energy at massive scales at the same time? Uh, for the uh, nuclear power, uh, the, the biggest challenge is, is the uh, economic. Uh, we can see that uh, the, the reactor power plant uh, uh, from generator two to generator three to generator four. Uh, it's uh, safer, but uh, uh, for the customer, uh, they, it's the same. It's electricity. So now the uh, clean energy, like uh, solar power and the wind power, the, the, the price is getting lower and lower. And uh, that's a big challenge to, to the nuclear power. So the nuclear power need uh, survival. Uh, we must uh, lower the price. And uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, the solar power and the wind power is not uh, stable. Uh, if the, uh, the cloudy and the no wind uh, for one week or one month, uh, that, 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 that's, that's no, no power. So we still need the nuclear power to supply. So I, I think in the future that uh, uh, the uh, fast, uh, uh, fast breed uh, neutron reactor power, uh, maybe in the future uh, will be uh, built. Uh, and also uh, uh, for a long time, uh, the the fusion uh, reactor power uh, will be the uh, 
future for the uh, human power requirement. Uh, like uh, said that the, the power increase is so fast. I think uh, by the end there will be fusion uh, power. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go out of order, Cam. You're going to have to wait your turn. We're going to Shannon next, actually, because Mr. Zhou is talking about the challenges of price competition with other clean energy resources. What other policy measures are needed, in particular in the United States, in order to level the playing field for nuclear? I, I think there's a lot that we need to put in place to first have common recognition that clean is clean. You'll often hear me say, let's get rid of all the colors. Let's stop talking about green. Let's stop talking about pink. Ultimately, are there emissions associated with a technology? If the answer is no, then they need to have equal footing, and policy needs to support that. We need to get the language right to ensure that nuclear energy is considered a clean technology, because it is. It is an absolute clean technology. And we also need to think about a balanced approach to how we evaluate these systems. Uh, in the nuclear industry, all, we all know that we look at the end product, that the waste or the used nuclear fuel from day one. That's part of our planning, that's part of our cost structure, and thus also impacts the economics of our system. We don't do that with other energy technologies. So if we're going to compare technologies on a performance basis as well as an economic basis, we need to start looking at life cycle. Life cycle materials utilization, resourcing, end of life considerations, and bring all of that into the comparison of these technologies so that we truly are comparing apples to apples. And we need to understand that these technologies don't have equivalent lifespans. Yes, it may be faster, it may be lower capital cost to build a renewable technology system, but it's not going to operate as long as a nuclear plant that could operate for 60, 80, maybe we'll even push them to 100 years. Those are investments that are very long duration, and we need to bring that into the discussion period. And from many of my discussions with renewable colleagues, it's not well understood that nuclear is such a different game when we talk about costs, when we talk about end of life uh, considerations that it's not a level playing field yet. And so the more we talk about that and bring that into our evaluations, the more we'll start seeing comparisons that are appropriate to each of the technologies. And it's not us versus them. It's how do we work together effectively to meet our ever-growing energy demands. I'm glad you highlighted the importance of public perceptance, public acceptance of nuclear mm -hmm. energy. I would like to turn it to Hassan to talk about this a bit more. It's viewed differently in different countries. What is the role of public acceptance in the UAE? Do you think this is a challenge or a hurdle for nuclear energy and its ability to contribute to these broad applications, including in the steel industry? If, if you allow me, I wanted to finish with two quick points. One of them is the people. But before that, we need to be aware that there are also supply chain challenges for the development of the future energy networks. Today, I mean, 200 years ago, it used to take only six elements to make the energy network. Today, 33 elements go into it. Gallium, serenium, iridium, indium, you know, things that I cannot even pronounce. All these elements are going to go into the future energy network, and the ores from which we can get these uh, elements are depleting. And if you look globally, the quality is just dropping, you know, so it's going to become more and more difficult. So that's something we need to factor in when deciding on the future solutions. And on the people, my suggestion is that we need to put the people, the public, at the heart of the green energy transformation. Really, without having the public very well educated and becoming very well aware of what are the challenges and what are the solutions, we will not get the buy-in. We need to get the buy-in of the people, and that can only come by just spreading knowledge. Thank you, and I'm constantly impressed by the number of numbers that you're able to hold in your head and <laughs> illustrate at one time. It's, it's very impressive. So we're gonna turn final question to Cam. You know, all of this is only possible if we have the fuel. X Energy has a, a unique way of going about that. Can you tell our audience the plans around fuel to make sure that, one, we might have the reactors to meet all of this growing demand in various applications, but what about the fuel side? Yeah, definitely, but I just wanted to make this point which is, I think, really important in terms of what you said earlier, which is 
we really, as a planet, as humanity, are in a dire situation. Doesn't matter China, United States, it doesn't matter. And I don't think the awareness, uh, and I think as uh, Salim was talking about, has risen to the point where we recognize that, you know, how bad of a situation we're in and how much we need to do. And it doesn't matter it's renewables or nuclear, whatever. If you put all the nuclear plants that we're doing in all the countries, still, in terms of where we are and where we need to go, is a drop in a bucket. I mean, that's, that's how important uh, this is. Now, um, in terms of what you were asking, uh, uh, in, in terms of fuel, uh, yeah, just building a nuclear reactor is, is not sufficient. Uh, we, need, we need to have the fuel, and that's the reason I sort of decided that we're gonna build a, a fuel manufacturing. Uh, and, and again, um, you know, I, I emphasize again, um, we need to start not thinking in terms of one-offs, but you know, how do we mass produce these in terms of to solve the uh, planet's problem? And, and so, um, um, you know, there is challenges uh, still. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Zhao can talk, uh, talk to you about that in terms of, uh, for advanced reactors, for most of them you need uh, um, high assay LEU, you know, uh, with enrichment up to 20%. And, and especially with all the situation that happened with Russia and Ukraine, uh, at least in the United States, we need to figure out how to make that possible. That's a feedstock to a fuel manufacturing organization. Um, uh, and so that's, that's a major challenge, but I know DOE is taking some major steps in, in uh, basically in in incentivizing industry to get into that business. Uh, recently, Centris was able to uh, create some uh, HELU, and, uh, and I know other organizations are getting into that. But again, uh, it's just not the reactors, the, all the supply chain, including the fuel, and the things that goes into the fuel, that's a problem. And especially because of the COVID the last few years, uh, the sub supply chain and logistics has become a major issue, and as a result, the cost has also gone up, which is not a good thing. But, you know, I just, I just hope, I just want to emphasize this point that um, the awareness, the people, that we got to get, uh, forgive me for saying that, to this oh shit moment where we all recognize that, wow, we need to have this awareness, this, this recognition, uh, this rise of, uh, rise of consciousness that we all need to come together, uh, if not uh, civilization may be at stake. Uh, I, I used to say, you know, the dinosaurs didn't have a choice. We do. Uh, and I hope we get the point of uh, recognizing that. After this panel, I want to hear if whether or not your concerns about the future of humanity is why you became a space entrepreneur so you can abandon all of us when the time is right. Find new homes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for this excellent discussion. It's great to hear the examples of nuclear energy innovation and how it is and can be used for a diversity of applications. So please join me in thanking our panelists for this conversation, and uh, thank you all. Thank you.